Hey, this is Mike Boland, analyst at BI Kelsey, and I'm here to talk today about the local on-demand economy or the Uberification of local services. Um, and this is an area we're covering um, increasingly. Uh, we put out a white paper on this. We're doing a conference uh, June 12th in San Francisco. Um, and what I want to do now is spend about 15 minutes going over uh, really the, the highlights and what we're seeing as the opportunity in this space. Uh, one of the things that we think is important is really knowing the space at granular levels and what makes it tick and what's driving it. Um, and I think that helps us accomplish um, a better perspective of where there are entry points for innovation and uh, disruption and um, business opportunity. So starting off, what are the fundamentals of the local and on-demand economy? It's best first to define it. Um, it's been known as collaborative consumption and sharing economy in the past. Um, we've branded it as the local on-demand economy to um, really um, – I guess, characterize uh, some of the business opportunities. So at its heart, what it is is apps that summon products or services on demand to be fulfilled or delivered offline in one's local market. It's very much a local story, as we'll see. Uh, for users, Load is bringing immediate needs to their fingertips. This is very much resonating in the on-demand culture that's evolving, as we'll go over. Um, and then for service providers, uh, Load creates a lot of marketplace transparency. It aggregates demand for them, um, and that in turn reduces their marketing and customer acquisition costs in very interesting ways. So the result is bringing buyer and seller together more efficiently, more directly, and with leaner unit economics, as we'll go over. So really what's driving all of this? Several factors. I'll mention a few of them. Um, mobility, um, certainly. Uh, smartphone penetration has created um, a culture in which we expect and are conditioned um, to enjoy um, everything on demand. I like to say the mobile device is a remote control for the physical world. So that has very much conditioned us to expect lots, lots of things on demand. Now exacerbating that trend is the millennial generation. Um, it's, it's a generation for which the term on demand could practically be a tagline. Uh, they're known to be very um, uh, self-entitled and, and um, in need of things immediately. Um, and this is very important as that generation um, continues to cycle into the buying empowered ranks of the adult consumer population. Um, and you also have other factors like geographic, uh, urbanization. We have more people living in cities now than we ever have. Um, that creates a population density that engenders a certain network effect or, or easier to get marketplaces off the ground. Um, there's also a lot to be said for urban lifestyle, um, things like not owning a car or not owning a washer dryer or a tool shed. These are things and opportunities where um, filling those gaps with on-demand services um, has really taken root, um, especially with the kind of ongoing, I guess, cultural paradigm shift of the way we think about owning things. Um, it's very important. Um, so another kind of dynamic to all of this is it's really a game of balancing supply and demand. Um, all of the factors I just mentioned um, are very much on the demand side um, and, and causing demand to be very pervasive. These are deep-rooted cultural and tectonic shifts um, that I believe is going to sustain the demand side. I think the, the, the hard part and really the success factors in, in the current on-demand economy players like Uber and others uh, are, are really working um, to optimize the supply side. And what I mean by that is bringing together previously disaggregated um, points of value. So that could be individuals' time or their knowledge or their skill set um, that, that's very kind of fragmented. Bringing that all together with using mobile technology um, to to kind of create liquidity uh, from that kind of remnant time in people's day or other things that can be monetized if brought into a network and then deployed to meet that demand. Um, so it's all about that kind of supply side liquidity, and that's one of the common elements we've seen um, in a lot of successful uh, load marketplaces. Excuse me. Um, now another thing that's really helping this along is is again mobility and mobile really creates. The, the data sets we need to kind of 
reach that marketplace transparency, having a, 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 um, a network of, of dispatched service providers, knowing who's available, where they are, and other things that help kind of create the logistical systems that make these load marketplaces run. Um, you know, Uber is a good example of that. And, and one other quote I like to go back to, this is mentioned by Brendan Benzing, who's CEO of My Neighbor. He was recently on the BI Kelsey conference stage, and he said something that resonated with me, which is that what we're seeing is yield optimization, essentially. So Uber in the early days had a brick business, which was town cars, but it was all the time in between rides that was the mortar. And that's the value that technology is finally extracting due to mobility. So it's again, it's a, it's a, it's the science of bringing together disaggregated supply, aggregating and then deploying that um, by building these logistical systems um, through mobility and mobile data. Um, a, a few examples here, and, and this really brings up one of the other kind of attributes of local on-demand economy, which is its unit economics. Because buyer and seller are linked together more directly in more efficient ways, it really compresses the supply chain um, that has traditionally compressed margin. What I mean by that are necessary things to start and run a business like a storefront and a marketing budget and all these types of things. Load in some ways sidesteps many of these, creating unit economics that when done right can do things like save money for the consumer, um, also have healthy margins for the service provider, and then still allow some margin to be shared with the provider of the load app that's creating the marketplace, the, the Ubers of the world. Um, so, so here are a few examples of how that's playing out. Uh, Grubhub is a company that's not, you know, known too much recently for its place in the kind of on-demand pantheon. Um, but, you know, if you could argue it's one of the original on-demand companies in being in kind of food order and delivery. But one thing it's been doing recently is very interesting. So it's been working with um, restaurants in New York that aren't sit-down restaurants. Um, so for example, uh, wherever there's a kitchen or ability to make food professionally, that's the case with a lot of catering companies and a lot of other kitchens in New York that are popping up. Um, so these kitchens have a certain advantage in terms of um, economics because they do not have the overhead of having to have the storefront, having to have the expensive real estate where they're going to get foot traffic, having the bottlenecks of how many people they can sit in a day, having marketing, having wait staff, all that other stuff. It just gets right to the essence of someone cooking food and then someone um, consuming that soon after that. That's kind of what I mean by compressing the, the supply chain. Um, so what Grubhub is doing is working with these companies um, and, and having their traditional food delivery business now have this on-demand uh, facet in which some of these um, individual independent kitchens are delivering food so the customer gets it for far cheaper because there's the lack of overhead being passed on to them. Um, the, the chefs in these situations are also making healthy margins because, again, their costs have been significantly lowered. Um, and then Grubhub also takes a cut. Uh, another example um, that isn't a big category, but I think it, it represents some of the dynamics that I want to get across here of some of the success factors of, of load is car washes. So um, similar to restaurants, one of the largest cost structure of a car wash is the physical uh, location and the real estate. And that has to be on a busy intersection to attract uh, cars to come in. Um, so what Wipe is doing, it's one of the companies in this space, is deploying car wash professionals to work in your driveway to work on your car and use your water and be deployed in this very low barrier way that, again, reduces the overhead in ways that can be passed on to the customer. So the customer wins in getting a cheap on-demand car wash right in their driveway uh, when they want it. The, the car wash professional um, with lowered overhead still makes margin, and then so does Wipe. It's also interesting, too, um, in these examples, it really brings up the, the less of a need for a storefront um, where business is being done without things like real estate. And also another point this is bringing up is that the, the demand is being deployed, I'm sorry, the supply is being de deployed to meet the demand in a very um, real-time fashion. 
um, instead of having a business where there are these major kind of upfront investments and fixed costs, which then have to deal with things like lulls in business. In this case, there are no lulls because it's a very efficient linking of demand when it happens in real time. It's, it's analogous in the retail world to the just-in-time inventory system, uh, where inventory is deployed right when it is needed, rather than um, kind of eating into cash flows by sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, that was a model popularized in the 80s by Harley Davidson. A lot of other companies have done this, uh, most recently Tesla. Um, but the point is, it's, it's a really kind of an efficient deployment of resources that has a lot of cash flow advantages. Um, another quick example. Um, is Avo. Avo Advisor is an on-demand service, and Avo has been operating for years as a network um, and a directory of professional lawyers. Um, now, what it's done is brought an, an on-demand feature into this marketplace, um, and, and what it's doing is creating liquidity um, in the remnant time throughout a given lawyer's day. So lawyers schedule things in one hour you know, shifts. Um, and, you know, they have all this, these gaps in between of an hour or less that traditionally is not worth it for them to fill uh, based on the need to have to, you know, find appointments and all this other stuff, scheduling payments. Um, now, Avo came along and said, let us handle all that. Let us find customers for you. Um, let us handle the, the scheduling and the payment processing. All you got to do is answer the phone. Um, and, and the way this has all worked out is that it's 15 minutes with a lawyer for 39 bucks. Now they're able to go far below their um, normal billable rate because Alvo is handling all this other overhead and, and, and logistics for them. Um, now, th uh, excuse me, 15 minutes might not seem like a lot, but it's actually great. Uh, I, I test drove this. It's great that you can, at the front end of a legal process, just level set. Find out where you need to be, what kind of legal artillery you need for any given situation, rather than the overkill of meeting with a lawyer for an entire hour, uh, which can cost up to $400, to get that same level of just kind of initial consult. Um, so lawyers also love this because a certain amount of these initial consults turn into, you know, larger business for them. So it's also a lead generation tool. Um, so I, I also bring up Avo uh, because um, you know, it, it's interesting. The on-demand economy is traditionally thought of as what I like to call uh, drivers and dry cleaning. Um, but it's really expanding into not only other verticals, but it's moving up the ladder to higher end professional services. We're talking doctors, lawyers, architects. Design is an area I really think it's going to move into in terms of both graphic design. You need a, a logo for your business very quickly or perhaps um, interior design, um, renovating a closet or some of these kind of smaller projects that can be done in an atomized way that the on-demand economy engenders. Um, it's also worth noting that millennials, I mentioned millennials before in light of the fact that they are great consumers of load. They are also going to be a big proponent of load supply side. Uh, Mary Meeker actually reported last, last week that millennials are now the largest constituent of um, on-demand service providers. And if you think about it, it makes sense because the, the millennial generation has a high affinity for things like flexibility, um, empowerment, um, autonomy, um, and, and the things that, that load-type services offer. Now, as it moves up the ladder to higher-end professions, it's going to be even more appealing for the millennial generation. And the segments of that generation that might have higher degrees or higher skill sets um, in some of these other areas. Um, so winding down here, what does all this lead to? One, one kind of theme you might be able to pick up here in what I've been saying is that um, you know, it creates all these marketplace efficiencies and compresses the supply chain. In doing so, it has the um, potential to displace local marketing as we know it. And what I mean by that is local marketing, which is bought upfront in advance, whether that's a, a Yellow Pages ad or a Google search campaign or a number of other ways that small businesses can market themselves in order to generate demand and acquire new customers. Now, Load, by comparison, achieves that same level of customer acquisition, but does so in a real-time basis on an ongoing basis. Um, so you pay to essentially be part of a network and to be deployed to real-time demand, thus achieving that same level of customer acquisition that traditional local marketing has done. So using Uber as an example, that's an Uber everyone's familiar with. The drivers in the Uber system 
um, instead of operating as individual proprietors and having to take out an ad in the yellow pages and other operational costs and upfront risk, instead just simply join the network um, in a very low barrier manner and then pay 20% of their revenues on an ongoing basis. Um, and for that, they get not only the customer acquisition, but the scheduling, the payment processing, the back end stuff that they wouldn't have been able to do on their own without a great deal of fixed costs and upfront investment. So that's very attractive for a lot of uh, verticals. Drivers, for example, as we're just going over now, used to be a very large spending category um, in terms of yellow pages and, and local search and other local media channels. Um, so you know, where else could this go in terms of local verticals? Now that's a scary concept to a lot of you know, traditional constituents of the local media ecosystem. Um, the local media providers, the ad, I'm sorry, the publishers. Now, um, though that's the case, and though we believe that uh, load is going to eat into um, the, the 140 billion that's spent on local advertising, according to BIA Kelsey, it's really going to end up being a net positive because the on-demand economy has the potential to increase the addressable market of small businesses. Um, so a few numbers there. The, the SMB marketplace right now in the U.S. is about 27 million small businesses, according to the SBA. Um, about 19% of those advertise. Now, the rest, the 81%, which is to the tune of about 22 million businesses, is Load's addressable market because right now they're not advertising. But Load is a lower barrier solution that might get that vast majority of the SMB marketplace on board. Now, the question is, can local media players um, and publishers, um, and should they, um, and can they, um, build, buy, or acquire, or tack on load-type services to join the bundle for a more holistic kind of bundle um, with the already existing marketing and advertising products they've been selling? I believe the answer is yes, uh, because not only do those, those kind of things go hand in hand, there's a lot of... Um, synergies there with the things they're already selling. But one important trend that we've been watching over the last three years in local is that local is not just about selling small businesses advertising and marketing anymore. It's really about helping them um, operate their businesses on an ongoing basis. So not just getting customers, but keeping those customers and serving those customers. So what I mean by that is back-end systems. I mean scheduling systems, uh, reservations, loyalty programs, payment processing, all of these things that are more operational in nature than they are about marketing. Um, now, the bonus there for the companies that have started to do this is that there is a great deal more retention with these types of products. The switching costs are higher for a small business to change or turn off their payment processing or their schedule, scheduling system than it is to turn off their marketing campaign. Um, and that's why local advertising has been such a high churn business. It's been a major pain point in the industry. So moving towards some of these operational things um, is really a, a kind of a bonus for um, media companies that go in this direction. Um, and load is very much um, key to a lot of these types of things, helping businesses on an ongoing basis, get customers, keep customers, schedule business, get paid, all that stuff, very much central to the logistics that are, and the logistical systems that are happening with load. Um, so I'll put a period there. Um, that's kind of the main takeaway. Um, there's a lot of other market sizing we'll be doing, um, and really a lot to this, this ecosystem. Those are just a few high-level points, the things making it run. Again, the point there is to really start to know it and what's driving it, because I think that's important to really starting to identify where there are um, entry points for innovation um, and business opportunities. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. My name is Mike Boland. I'm an analyst with BI Kelsey. Stay tuned for more videos, and thanks for listening. Thank you.